we have a new DBE program chief. As you all know that Madalena, um, she went over to FHWA in January. And so um, we have now hired Ty Fleming. Um, she is our new DBE program chief. She's been with us about a week and a half now. So we're very excited to have her on board. Um, and Ty, if you want to um, tell just a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'll make it quick this time. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm Ty Fleming. Like Tondra said, I'm a new program chief. I've had quite a week uh, meeting a lot of my staff and, and learning more about the program. I really have enjoyed myself. And I started last Monday, like Tondra said. Um, I've been invited to a few meetings here and there, and, and some of you I've met in person, some of you I haven't. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to, to being a part of these meetings and, and getting to know each of you. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Ty. So on the, um, on the line also, we have Ann Duffield. Ann, do you want to say anything? Um, oh, no, no. Hello, everybody. Just, and, and. Uh, what what agency or what work do you do? If you could, I'm tell with us? Mid States Rebar, so we're a fabricator. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> How about okay. Ashley Bowman? Good morning. I'm here with Integrity Grading and Excavating. We have offices in Schofield, Madison, and La Crosse. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome to the meeting. Um, Jeff Bowman. Yep. Thanks, uh, Jeff Bowman with Wistat. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, Christina Crane. She's our organizer. Um, Christina Crane, I kind of help out. I'm a DBE consultant, and I help out with these um, the stakeholder meetings as well as helping out with compliance for Wistat. And I also work with M Squared Engineering. Wonderful. Thank you, Christina. Um, thank Dan you. Webster. Right, maybe he stepped away. There he is. Oh. Dan, did I hear you? Yeah, you keep going. Now you're unmuted. Oh. Looks like Dan's having technical difficulties here. Dan, if you're able to speak later, just let us know. Dave Bros. Morning, Connor. Dave Bros with EMCS and also representing ACEC. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, Dwayne Johnson. Morning, Tondra. Good morning, everybody. I'm representing Span and Associates. Um, I'm just checking on Bruce Span to see if he's going to be joining us today. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Deb Evers. Good morning, everybody. I'm Deb Evers. I'm our Southeast yep. Region Consultant Unit Supervisor. All right. My apologies. Um, Deb. No, no worries. No relation, <laughs> right, to the governor. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, uh, Ty, we've heard from you. Uh, Maggie Givens. Marjorie Gibbings, Labor Development Specialist for OBAC. Thank you, Maggie, Welcome. Marguerite, <laughs> Lori. Hi, Lori Green, DBE uh, Certification Support, um, working as a consultant too for uh, WISDOT. Right. Thank you. M. Morning, Emlyn Grizar with WISDOT as well, Southeast Region. Thank you. And Bob. Muted. Bob is muted. Yeah, I didn't want you to hear one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't want to hear what he had to say initially. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Gutierrez, uh, Southeast Region Director and Pothole Filler um, yeah. with uh, Governor Evers and the Mayor of Milwaukee uh, last week with a couple others. So wow. welcome. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Benji. Good morning, everybody. Benji Hayek, DBE Program Engineer for Wistat. All right, thank you, ben Benji. Um, um, David Hubbard, my partner in crime. Yeah, good morning, Thanks, everyone. Uh, David Hubbard, I'm the Business Relationship Manager representing the Secretary's Office. Um, and I'm co-chair, as Tondra just mentioned, of this committee. Awesome. John Anderson. Good morning, everyone. John Anderson, Southeast Region Director for WRCP Big Step and HSCT Training Provider. Right. Thank you, John. 
and we will we'll overlook your autopilot. I believe that's you. <laughs> um, Joe Davis. Now I get a chance to welcome Ty. Hey, Ty. Good to have you on board. Looking <laughs> forward you. to sitting down with you. Joe Davis from the Construction Business Group. Nice to meet you. Thank Same you. Same here. And um, Ty, also they call it CBG. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Joshua Johnson. Good morning, everybody. Joshua Johnson. I'm with Jobs for the Future. Uh, I am also the co-chair of the Labor Committee, and I am the former state director of the Wisconsin Apprenticeship System. All right. Thank you, Joshua. Um, and then we have John McCoon. John McCoon, Program Controls for Southeast. All right. David Wistock. Good morning, this is one? David Nguyen, DOT Southeast Region Project Chief. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then we have um, Bumi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Bumi Olapo, Project Development Section Chief for 3R Project in the Southeast Region. Thank you, Bumi. Sean Race. Tarasi. Morning, everybody. Sean Race, uh, Southeast Freeways Construction Supervisor. All right. Randy Crump. Hello. Prism. I'm Randy Crump with Prism Technical. We're DBE consultants. I'm a recovering engineer, actually. Um, um, <laughs> I was appointed to the board to build the original Wisconsin Center a long time ago and found a passion for DBE work. And um, started PRISM Technical 29 years ago, and we do diversity and inclusion on major construction projects, mostly vertical. We did do the DB goal setting for the streetcar and monitored it for the city of Milwaukee. All right. Thank you, Randy. Um, then we have Lamont Robinson. Hey, good morning, everyone. Lamont Robinson, uh, Director of Office of Economic Inclusion with Milwaukee County. Thank you. Our fellow UCP certifier, DB certifier, um, Jason Rosell. Hey, good morning, everyone. Jason Rosell. I am with uh, WISDOT Southeast Region. I'm the Southeast Freeways Construction Chief. Nice. Sarah? Good morning. I'm Sarah Janice with Integrity Grading and Excavating along with Ashley. I'm glad to be here today and welcome, Ty. Uh, we're excited to be working with you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> All right, Andrea Weddle-Henning. Weddle Good morning, Andrea Weddle-Henning. I'm the direct, Director of Transportation Engineering for Milwaukee County DOT. Oh, nice, nice. Marquise? Marquise Young with the Wisconsin DOT, and I'm the utilization engineer. Thanks. All right, and I know, um, Harvin, you, you joined us. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I jumped on a little bit late. Harvin Singh, uh, president and CEO of Singh and Associates. We have done some successful um, uh, mentor protege, and I'm very vested in supporting the DBE and overall workforce development programs. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I see that also Darren Fortney has joined us. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, Darren Fortney, Senior Principal with Short Elliott Henderson SEH. Uh, we're currently engaged with the department on a mentor protege uh, program and super excited to be here. So thank you. All right. We're excited to have you. Did I miss anyone? Hey, good morning. This is Andy Kowski oh, uh, sorry, with Andy. HNTB. I'm a project manager engineer out of our Milwaukee office, and HNTB is also in the mentor protege program with Span and Associates. Nice. All right. Well, we'd like to uh, welcome everyone um, and thank you for welcoming Ty as well. Um, and I just kind of wanted to go a bit over uh, what the focus is for this group, just to remind us, and especially with Ty um, being new here. And um, so the this stakeholder advisory committee um, is, is set up so that it uh, works. Um, you know, the stakeholders are working with WISDOT to um, find approaches that we can achieve better DBE 
participation and um, any strategies to monitor the progress. Um, it works to help with upcoming transportation projects so that we can learn about opportunities. Um, the DVEs can learn about opportunities to partner with other firms, um, acts as a liaison to the communities, and then helps um, create and implement strategies to cultivate a diverse workforce. The stakeholder committee is also an opportunity to offer your perspective about potential improvements to WSDOT's DBE program. We're seeking the participation of more DBE firms. And we, uh, of course, we meet quarterly, and I want to thank everyone for adjusting their schedule. Um, normally, we would have had this meeting at the end of May, but uh, because of um, a, a lot of our staff having um, at, at the conference with our conference with our um, with Secretary Thompson last week. Um, he's the president of AASHTO. Um, many of us were in that meeting and were unable to join. So we rescheduled. And so again, thank you for adjusting your schedule. So that said, we're going to go ahead and go into um, the Southeast project opportunities. And we'll have Bob and his team. And, and what, 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 what I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure, David, did you have anything else to add? Nothing to add. Thank you, Tonder. Okay. All right. So that said, we'll go ahead and have Bob um, and his team. Yeah, sure. Thank, and thank you. Thank uh, you. We've been really busy. Um, <laughs> it's been a, 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 yeah, a very, very busy uh, month for myself and Emlyn. Um, just getting um, a, a lot of things started up, and uh, but uh, we like to work. It's all right. It's challenging. Um, hey, a couple announcements before we uh, get started with our group and hopefully our our folks um, kind of coordinated this. <laughs> um, I, I, I did talk with uh, several hundred people um, recently um, at uh, the public Wisconsin Public Policy Forum yesterday. Uh, it was an interesting group and an interesting panelist um, there. Um, we have on um, 5-8 uh, Cream City Conference, and David Wen will be um, on a panel um, talking about uh, DB opportunities and and aspects of, of that. Um, and then Joe, I don't know, <laughs> Joe sounded like he's uh, a little bit under the weather, but I, I do know we have a, a CBG, uh, and we're going to be talking with Joe Davis a little bit about um things that he needs to interact with us on five seven so joe if you're if you're unable to to do that we can certainly um you know push that off a little bob you don't get rid of me that easy man <laughs> checking stuff out guys from Kalaska, we go to school here great <laughs> okay and then um, the, the last thing I wanted to congratulate uh, Dave Bros from EMCS. Uh, he's recently was, uh, announced that he's president of EMCS now. Um, they've been an amazing uh, consultant uh, contractor for us for a very long time. And so, Dave, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. No need to do that, but much appreciated. Okay. We, go, we go back a long way. <laughs> All right, so for today, we've got David Wen in majors and local program, uh, Jeff Bowen, Southeast Freeways Design. Uh, he's got a lot about the East West and Jason Roselle. It's a huge backbone program right now going on. Um, and and Bowie with our South uh, State Highway program. So, um, and then, uh, um, so I'll, I'll leave it up to th those individuals. I'm not sure who's going first, but. Um, I'll go, we'll go in that order, Bob. Um, you know how I like to go first. Um, <laughs> didn't want to wait for the other guys. Um, sure. Well, good morning, Ty. Uh, nice to meet you finally. Um, I, I know in the past we worked a lot with uh, Madalena and her staff. Um, you know, things we, between the two groups, we have a very good working relationship. Um, I know Benji on a weekly base, basis, she's very involved with uh, I-43 major project. So, um, you know, she's been very helpful. I, I think she's actually on the agenda today. She may be reporting out on some of um, 
you know, the numbers, the issues that we may have in the project. Uh, so as far as I-43 major is concerned, um, the goals were set for the entire program was very aggressive. We set it at um, 11% and um, our contractors committed 15.6%, uh, putting that in, uh, in dollar amounts. Um, so the committed dollar amount was $64.5 million. And to date, we have paid out uh, roughly about $51 million. So that's close to 80%. Uh, the project is going very well from the work standpoint. Um, those of you who have driven through there lately, you, um, you do see a lot of, uh, I mean, a couple crossovers that we implemented to get the work done specifically um, near the Brown Deer interchange and another crossover up in the Mequon Road interchange. Uh, the focus for the summer, now that we got a UP Railroad in place over the winter is to get um, the south, uh, southbound built on the, on the south end. That would be between um, Bender Road and, uh, and County Line. And, and the county line interchange is built to the, to the north of that is the Mequon Road interchange. That's where we have the traffic crossover and uh, onto the existing southbound lanes. And we're focusing on rebuilding, uh, building the new northbound uh, bridge and roadway. So as you drive through there, slow down, obey the speed limit. We do have law enforcement in the area. Um, so with that, I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Uh, Ty, if you are talking, we can't hear you. <laughs> the mute button strikes again. <laughs> yeah. No, I was just going to say congratulations on the 15.6% contract commitment and and thank you for the welcome. I, I look forward to working with you, David. In the way that we, you know, we do interact with each other, which is good. And and I wanted to kind of put the name to my face, and uh, hopefully there there won't be too many big big problems from the project. And so, <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. Nice welcome. to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, David, on on the, on the local end, we don't necessarily have goals on the local projects, but um, big big program there in the, in the local area, right, David? Yeah, uh, yeah, it depends on the project. We do set goals typically between eight and ten percent, and uh, you know they're all trending well. Um, as you, we all know that we have good BBEs uh, in the area. You know. The capacity is is well used, so which is good to see, Bob. Fantastic. Okay, uh, we'll shift it over to Jeff Bowen, huh? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Morning again, everybody. Jeff Bowen from Westad. I'm the uh, Southeast Freeways Design Chief in the region. So we've got some big projects to talk about today. Um, we've got some contracts in the works for our West Leg design for 94 East West um, and Andy Kowski is is on the call today with HNTB and that that project had a goal of 500,000 uh, in DBE money and they have well exceeded that. Uh, the number we're, we're working with uh, them on right now is well above that $500,000. So, you know, thank you, Andy. Congratulations that that's a good good story and it's a big project. So we like to have those opportunities for our DBE folks. Um, on the stadium and East Lake project, that goal is at $4 million for DBE participation, and we will we will meet or exceed that one as well. I don't have an exact number today, but I know that it's it's up above the $4 million uh, in DBE participation on that side too. So again, those are those are final design contracts on a very large project. So I think that's that's something that we should uh, not forget about. Uh, my other one of my other projects I want to report out is the Lake Interchange or 794. 
Uh, we are still in the study phase on that project, so uh, about another year before we get into our preliminary and, and final design contract. So there'll be some opportunities that we'll be looking for uh, when that opportunity comes up in about a year. So any questions on those projects from anyone? All right. All right, <laughs> right Jays. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, if uh, if you've driven our freeways recently, <laughs> you, you know we've got a lot of work going on. Uh, that backbone program's huge, and coming off of the the zoo interchange, and um, congratulations on on completing that. But uh, you've got a huge backbone program right uh, going on, and and uh, some other th items. So I'll let you share. Yeah, thanks, Bob. So yeah, yeah I'm just gonna cover a couple of our um, major backbone projects that are are taking place right now. Um, I'm going to share my screen here quick just to show some some information. One second. So yeah, the, the first project is our 894 uh, resurfacing and kind of rehab project, which is a little over $60 million let value. Um, Zignego is the, the prime contractor on that project. Uh, but we had a goal of 8% and we're we're right at that 8% goal at the moment. And uh, things are going well on that project. It's a big project. There's a lot of work happening out there and uh, we're kind of working in the median at the moment, doing a bunch of storm sewer and they're uh, working on rebuilding the the Loomis Bridge over the freeway as well uh, with Lunda. So just uh, wanted to point out a few of the major DBE subcontractors on that project. Uh, adaptive electrical control, supplying a lot of electrical uh, and lighting equipment uh, and supplies. Uh, Arbor Green is a, is a big player on both the projects I'm going to talk about, doing signing, erosion control, landscaping, uh, working on uh, all those items. Hard Rock Sawing is a, a major subcontractor on 894, doing all the various sawing activities for the base patching and other things. And there's a uh, quite a bit of trucking. Um, just have uh, one trucking company uh, shown there. That's a significant portion of it. But I think uh, about I think over two million dollars of trucking on the 894 project um, within that DBE goal. Then the next project is the I-43 Brown to Capital, a same similar type project. They're just uh, north of coming out of the downtown area and doing some bri bridge rehab work out there, um, but a lot of median storm sewer and barrier wall and going to be resurfacing that that area with with new asphalt. So. $70 million project going on there and we had a 10% DBE goal and we're exceeding that by just a, a little bit and uh, some major subcontractors you'll see some similar names here uh, working with Zignego they're the prime on this project as well so adaptive electrical controls Arbor Green there with 2.8 million um, concourse sawing has a big chunk of work on this one and uh, MKE iron erectors and then uh, major major trucking on this project as well. So uh, some some big projects on the backbone project. We have quite a few other ones going on, but these are two of the the big ones that I wanted to just highlight today. And uh, yeah, things are going well, and uh, we're meeting and exceeding the DBE goals for for these projects. So. Any questions uh, about the backbone program or about uh, these projects or any other, I guess, opportunities there? It's like Joe Davis uh, raised his hand. Hey, Jason, congrats, yeah, man. Yeah, congrats <laughs> on the achievement. I, it's like, you know, Marquise and I, when I was, when my office was down at the PMC, that 894 leg around there, you guys actually had Bluetooth sensors for speed that the engineers could be able to calculate speed. Will that be part of some of your other projects so that um, as, you know, going through the large municipality like, you know, Milwaukee and Milwaukee County, 
Will that be on any of the other projects? And the second question is that, is there a possibility that the speed limit may increase because of the past, I mean, you know, the, the freeway being um, increased for more traffic along the way, or will it still remain at 55? Uh, two good questions there. I'm not sure if I can answer the question on the, the Bluetooth uh, uh, application there and the, the speed tracking. I don't know if anybody else from our, from our team can answer that one. I mean, we we certainly we we have a, a traffic management our traffic management center, and we have our traffic management support team that are constant constantly monitoring our, our work zones and our freeways for volumes, diversion, speed, um, accidents, and kind of putting together performance measure uh, reports related to that for all of our our major work zones that we're making sure that we're tracking that information and making, you know, data driven decisions uh, based on that and making sure that we're optimizing the opportunities and flexibility for the contractors so that they have, you know, longer work windows related to that. That's another area that we're kind of making sure that we're cognizant of and that, you know, that data helps us make those decisions. Uh, the speed limit should be staying the same based on where they are today in our freeway system. We have no um, no plans to modify those. There, we do have speed declarations that happen, Joe, sometimes in our work zone. So like, for instance, down on 43 in Rock County, right now we have some, uh, excuse me, Rock Freeway. Uh, we have some 43 projects going on down there, some resurfacings that uh we're reducing the speed limit to 55 miles per hour during the project and during those work zones um but then they will go back to their normal regulatory speed limit after the project is completed so fair enough i was just uh, i was talking to henry hurt and we were sharing that type of information as you know he's a dv electrical contractor and these sure. are you know, Wisconsin is doing a good job on kind of monitoring our freeways, especially as it deals with crash data. So I figure since I had you uh, on the call and it's so hard to get a hold of you because you're all golfing all of the time. I mean, I'm sorry, Bob, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> no, I said I'd ask you right here. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. My clubs are still in my basement, Joe. I haven't even thought about them yet. <laughs> yeah, you said that because the boss is on the, he's on the call, man. <laughs> Thank you, man. Appreciate it, Jason. Yeah, you're Joe, welcome. If, if, if I may comment on the speed limit in uh, Milwaukee County real quick. Typically in Milwaukee County with um, MCSO patrolling our freeway, um, I believe we typically leave it at 55 or slower. It's rare that we see anything higher than 55 with the exception down by in Milwaukee County near Drexel and Rawson. Uh, leading up to Ryan Road on 94, Joe. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't foresee A94 going any faster. Okay, thanks, David. Appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Joe. Great question. Um, I've asked uh, after Boomi goes, uh, maybe Emlyn can update us on the uh, Work Zone Safety Month um, upcoming things and, and other and then we'll and then we will also have uh, Dev Evers uh, talk a little bit about uh, um, some upcoming uh, construction opportunities. So, uh, Boomi State Highway okay. Program, yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Again, uh, <clears throat> as mentioned before, I my my group manages the three R projects, and we have uh, hundreds of projects. Um, quite a few in construction this year. We still have uh, a lot in design uh, coming up for next year uh, construction too. So um, two projects were highlighted today. I'm going to share uh, just to uh, give a heads up for the DBE for opportunity that might be coming up. Uh, uh, one of them is in uh, um, is uh, Highway uh, 50, 59 National Avenue. That's in the city of Milwaukee. 
Uh, the project overview for that is we we that's still currently in design. The project of uh, project limit for that is from South Fourth Street to Thirty Fourth Street. It's about uh, two point uh, six uh, six miles. It currently four four lane divided roadway and. Um, uh, it is going to be a road diet project, which is, you know, very unique. So it's uh, three uh, two third of the length of the project will be reduced from uh, four lanes to two lanes is a pavement replacement, total pavement replacement project. So um, it's going to include carbon gutter, it's, it's going to uh, include side work, uh, including the non-compliant uh, ADA curb ramps, uh, replacement of uh, stump sewer, and many more work. So there's going to be opportunity for DBE to to look out for those projects for that project coming up. Uh, so right now we the PSNE is scheduled for uh, May 20, May 2025, which is next year. And uh, and the uh, uh, is the let is November of uh, 2025. It's going to be a three-year construction project. Uh, the project is about uh, between 35 to uh, about 35 million dollar project. So it's going to be constructed under traffic. So um, uh, it's going to be one lane in each direction. Uh, under traffic, I mean, when when constructed. So uh, that's just giving a heads up on that. That will be coming up, and that's something that uh, 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 the DBE can be looking out for now. This also, we have a six-year program. We have uh, we did share a project that will be coming up uh, in the uh, following year. So it will be encouraged. We'll be encouraging the DBE also to keep an eye on that and look to our six-year program project coming up in the following year and try to either team up or you know put their hearts, uh, uh, put their name mm -hmm. in their hearts for that. Yeah. So, so that's. Well, thank you. you. You have something. Dwayne Johnson has a question. Okay. Go ahead, Dwayne. Thanks, Tondra. Thanks, Boomi. Uh, question the National Avenue project. Sure. Uh, maybe for you and Jeff uh, Bowen, how is that coordinated with uh, I-94 East-West? Yeah, it is. Uh, we are coordinating with that, with them. Um, right now, like I said, three quarter, I mean, two quarter of the, I mean, two third of the ro uh, roadway is going to be a road diet. The, the one third of it is going to be left as uh, four lanes, mainly because we're going to be waiting till uh, I-94 finishes their, their work in that area. So, and if the traffic still permits, we can reduce that section to uh, uh, two lanes, but we are coordinating with the um, east-west. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, and Dwayne, from our <clears throat> excuse me, from our end, we're we're coordinating with uh, West Milwaukee and others, uh, especially the um, intersection at National and Brewers Boulevard, and then heading to the west. Uh, Boomy stuff is is primarily to the east of Brewers Boulevard or whatever whatever you want to call that road these days, um, and and we're coordinating with West Milwaukee heading to the west. I don't know if I said that right, but Boomi's to the east. We're heading to the west. So um, upgrades at, at the intersection again, and then right-sizing National Ave to, to meet the new traffic demands. Thank so you. so National will be before the, the stadium and before the east leg of the east-west? Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> great, great. Hey, Joel, Joel, so, you you talk joe davis thank you boomy joe no davis we still have one more oh oh sorry okay so the other project that was highlighted uh i believe is the uh 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 lake drive project 
Okay. Okay, that was highlighted. That's uh, going to be um, uh, the project limit is from East Newberry Boulevard to uh, Edgewood. So it's this project that's going to be construct. Uh, it's going to be a pavement replacement as well. So uh, is uh, with uh, on street bike accommodation in each direction. So the the let date for that is going to be uh, June of uh, this year, 2024. And the um, the um, is I mean it's going to con construct a, it's a two year construction project. So the first stage of it will be from Kenwood to uh, uh, Edgewood, and the second stage that will that will start in July of this year. And that will go to uh, November, and the for next year the second stage that will be from Newbury to Kenwood. Uh, that will be this. Um, that will start in April of next year and goes through um, August of next year. So just to mention uh, the two projects, and uh, if there's any questions uh, or more inf uh, information needed, please uh, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Boomi. Yeah, those, those projects are real close to home, so um, I appreciate the information on that. Um, Joe Davis, you talked about speed and, and controlling speed and, and data on speed. And, and of course, you know, speed in the work zone is, is one of our primary concerns and keeping our folks safe. So I'll let Emlyn take it from here. Yeah, I mean, Bob said it eloquently, <clears throat> lots of things going on and uh, lots of our contractors in the field. Um, so all of you on the, the call are um, impacted by work zones and work zone safety. And we've had a few unfortunate incidents. Um, we lost a surveyor from Kapoor. Uh, we had an inspector um, just a few weeks ago uh, kind of get caught in the crossfire of some um, uh, a, a car shooting. Thankfully, he was not injured. Um, but yeah, we 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 continue to focus on work zone safety, uh, especially in May. So we've kicked off uh, a media campaign. We'll be doing events all over all over the state um, and highlighting those folks that make a difference out there and what what they what they experience on a day to day basis with really fast driving and, and reckless driving like we talked about. Um, so I'll put a link in some of our PSAs and other information to to have you kind of help shepherd some of that information. Um, and then if you have stories too, especially the, the contractors that are on the line, if you've got some stories that we should highlight and just, you know, remind our, our partners on the road to take it easy. Uh, we'd be happy to to take that um, down and and help kind of share that story. So yeah, I'll put the link in the in the chat and look for more media events coming out soon. Thank you, Amlin. Yeah, we all want to get home to our families, so um, just a just real important um, message there. Um, never too early to talk about construction management for the next year. It's 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 crazy, right? Um, but even even uh, um, you know Jeff talked uh, a little bit about you know West construction. Um, maybe that's a little too early, but um, I, I know Deb's got some information on um, um, some other construction management opportunities. So take it away, Deb. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Yeah, you said exactly what I was going to say. It seems early, but it's really not. So time to start uh, thinking about the construction fair. So I just want to let everybody know uh, the construction fair is scheduled for Wednesday, September 18th, and it will be held virtually. We have found that's a really valuable tool because it falls at a time when all our construction staff is super busy, so it makes it easier for them to just call in instead of making the trip to Madison. Uh, let me give you a couple dates. The preview of the fair, all the fair packages statewide is going to be posted July 20th. 24th and uh, the NOIs are due back to us August 28th and just want to remind everybody that um, if you want to be considered as a prime consultant for construction oversight uh, firms do need to participate uh, if you're going to be just do sub work um, you don't necessarily need to participate but I always think it's a good idea you know just get all your faces in front of everybody statewide and and let them know who your staff are 
And for Southeast region, and this is really astounding, we're going to have, as as it looks now, um, over 80 con- construction packages, which is huge. And, you know, ranging from small $100,000 bridge, uh, bridge work, you know, all the way up to some of our larger backbone projects. So it's a good year. We're going to need all hands on deck and hopefully we can nab some of those young grads that are coming out of school and get them out on, on these projects. So any questions on that? I don't think so, but really okay. great. Yeah, really great notes for this some of that. Looks like we have one question from Mr. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, sure, John. So, um, what's the best way to connect to get those um, young folks engaged on those projects? Great question. I know, Emlyn, can you speak a little? We've been out at, you know, career fairs and at least from the WISDOT side uh, and maybe industry can maybe talk about any recruiting efforts. Um, you know, maybe Andy, if you or Dave, you guys want to talk about some successes you're having with getting new grads in? Uh, yeah, for I'll, I'll just I'll start. Um, you know, for us, um, you know, having having uh, interns and co-ops is huge with with hiring new graduates. It's just it's our pipeline. Um, last summer we had we had thirty interns and. Uh, this summer we're gonna we're gonna do that again, and and not only do we do college interns, but we're actually hiring high school interns um, through some some local programs. So um, you know you, you got it, just kind of what you said, uh, Deb. You got to get to the career fairs, um, um, work with with the colleges. You know we go we go to Platteville, Marquette, UW Madison, MSOE. We go up to Michigan Tech. There's a great pipeline of of talent. Um, and even the, the tech schools as well with construction inspection. It's not just limited to engineering grab, but there's 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 talent from the tech schools as well. Well, here's the lucky twist of fate. Um, I We have some interns, uh, WRTP Big Step that we're working with, and we're looking for uh, spots for them. So I was kind of see if there's anyone who was like a point person on this who I could connect with later. Yeah, you know, the Daily Reporter um, just had an article um, about some of the coordination with high schoolers too, Andy. Um, so yeah, John, if, uh, on the DOT side, you can feel free to connect with me. We okay. um, are getting some great students. We have 20 coming in um, and we've also, uh, we gave out offers for May graduates of this year, last year. So um, we're we're hoping to bring on those folks, and uh, we have actually four offers out right now on some CE entries. Um, so we're excited for for our workforce. Um, at Super least on sweet. The professional. Okay, side. I'll, I'll be I'll be reaching out. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, John. I'll put my email and phone number in the chat too, um, so we can connect. Harun, awesome. thank you. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wanted to echo what um, Andy was saying because the interns are really, really important. I mean, Singh is a smaller firm, so we don't necessarily have 30. You know, we probably <laughs> can do two. But um, the other thing that we found is that we get a lot of foreign students that are on OPT. And they're actually quite, ex like I cannot and the other firms here can attest or say what they do, but I can't afford to sponsor them. Right, and that's what they need. But they are good. We've used them for field work where they can get some experience and then perhaps jump to another larger firm where they will get sponsored. Uh, the one thing that I know um, ACEC is working on, at least this is an issue I bring up for ACEC because I'm in Illinois and uh, Wisconsin, is they're trying to, uh, the problem with it is the H-1B visa. So the next best thing we're trying to get is get that OPT to be extended another three years. So you're not losing somebody after a year because if they don't make the lottery, <laughs> they have two chances, they gotta leave in 30 days. So there's a little bit of a challenge there. But, um, and with the career fairs, you really have to hit the fall career fairs. That's where you get most of your opportunity to find people who will commit for the summer. So. Quite honestly, that is the the best option. But I don't know if anyone else has considered, um, you know, the foreign students. We have a lot of them, but 
uh, there's a little bit of a hitch, but some of them make great uh, yep. field inspectors because they're all here for construction management, a lot of them. So yep. just yep. my two cents. Fantastic. All right. We've got the Johnson show here, uh, Dwayne, and then uh, Joshua. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Uh, John, I put my uh, contact information in the chat box. Uh, could you likewise put your information in the chat box? Thank you. All right. Thank you. My pleasure. <clears throat> yeah, just a real quick question. Um, so as you were talking about recruitment, you know, my ears instantly perk up as I start to hear about recruitment, especially when we're thinking about in construction and 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 some of those occupations that are tied into the construction business. Uh, a question I just want to throw out there for any of you employers that are on the line or even at the, the WISDA folks, have there been any conversations <clears throat> around uh, building registered apprenticeship programs inside the office? So not the field, right? We know the field uses for the for all of the, the trades they use apprenticeship, but has there ever been, has there been any conversation thinking about utilizing uh, inside the office occupations to help build uh, registered apprenticeship pipelines into your organizations for those individuals who may not want to be a laborer, even though being a construction craft laborer is one of the awesome thing, most awesome things in the world. But for those who may not want to do that, might want to work as um, you know, surveying or, or some of the other various occupations inside of a construction company. The second part of that was, uh, I definitely agree um, that you have to hit uh, the schools uh, early <clears throat> in the in the fall. But as a caveat, I'm actually going to add on: if you're waiting till a senior year to get out and start recruiting, you're already behind. You all should be hitting eighth grade, just having conversations. Mm -hmm. Ninth grade, tenth grade, you should be following those folks along. And I know that's tough. That's a tough conversation to have because people are like, we need people now, but actually start to look out farther. And that way, those individuals get more comfortable with you, seeing you and engaging with you. So by the time their senior year does come, they do want to lean directly in and come out there and work for you. So just my two cents. The first question was definitely a, a legit like, has that been a thought process? Uh, because this is something that I've talked about a lot lately uh, with construction folks, but then the second was just my my two cents on the recruiting. But great work, everybody. Definitely great work. Sure, Em, you want to kind of handle that? Uh, nothing, in nothing formal, right? You get... Yeah, the only apprenticeships that we have are um, with our electricians. Um, that's about all we have, at right. least here in the region. Um, I'm not sure about the drillers in, in the Bureau of um, Technical Services. There might be an apprenticeship there. Um, but yeah, pretty pretty limited. Yeah, yeah it's, no. some, it's something to definitely would... think about, how to expand. Yeah. Sure. That's yeah. how you expand those pipelines. You expand sure. people's interest into the construction industry because not everybody wants to work in the field. but. Okay. You also can give individuals who are in the field an opportunity to transition into the office by yeah. taking one of those apprenticeships as well. Yeah, we've had a lot of um, conversation about our co-op program. Um, so we've, we're have we kind of reevaluating re that program um, and seeing if we could potentially, you know, lock in on, on people early uh, and be able to have them last here at DOT. I, I do want to mention too, Harvind, we are seeing so many um, candidates from Bangladesh um, and other countries, and they're so well qualified, but DOT doesn't sponsor work visas. Uh, the state of Wisconsin doesn't either. Um, Tondra, I think I kind of pushed that at one of the director meetings recently, and I think we should continue pushing because uh, it's definitely uh, a, a pool of candidates that are really, really good. Fantastic. Thank you, Tondra. I, I I think Joe, uh, John, your hands up from last time, but uh, no, 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 no. I just put it back up. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, thanks. I was just real quickly. I'll just yeah. I'll just give you my my two cents on uh, uh, you young people outreach outreach in general. So um, here in the Southeast, what we've been doing is we've been working uh, in partnership with the Racine Unified School District. Uh, and RAMAC, which is their Youth Apprenticeship Consortium. And so trying to specifically target uh, those young people who are engaged in youth apprenticeship programs 
um, simply because they already have a mind and focused on the skill trades. So by coming into the school and exposing them to the HCST and, and you know, what are the related trades that work in on the road construction, trying to let them know that this is an avenue. It's still tied to registered apprenticeship, um, but specifically as it relates to road building. And so we have found some success there and at least doing outreach uh, kind of to, to, to Josh's point. Specifically, we've been focused on the juniors and seniors, especially the graduating seniors, as we want to make sure we can help them transition from YA to RA, or uh, I'll say from youth apprenticeship to registered apprenticeship. Um, but at the same time, we know we do have to reach them younger. So we are talking to the freshman class. We are talking to um, the underclass because they need to know as well so they can start to ponder and imagine. And then those young people who are already engaged in some kind of CTE, um, some youth apprenticeship training, let them know that this is directly correlates and is a it is a pathway for them um, because they're all thinking, oh, I'm gonna be a plumber, I'm gonna be an electrician, but they don't know electricians work on the road. So you know we've been actively out there, and we're now starting to work with the Kenosha Unified School District as well. Same approach. Um, with focuses on schools that kind of do that work. I mean, we'll go to any school, but in Kenosha, there's K Tech School. They specifically are working with young people on the trades. In Racine, the Unified School District here has the Racine Academies. So they're specifically working with young people towards the trades and other career avenues. So, anyway, just kind of throwing that out there as, as um, a strategic approach to, to recruitment versus, you know, the kind of spitballing go everywhere you know i know we all have limited time limited resources so just wanted to share how we've been focusing our approach towards that thank you okay thanks uh ty this is how it usually goes sometimes uh <laughs> i apologize for going over but the collaborative discussion uh really goes just no, it, projects right it 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 goes on workforce development and, right. and uh, professional opportunities. So uh, go ahead, take it away, Tandra, I guess, or John or David. Sorry. All right. Um, so we'll move further in the agenda. And I just wanted to, um, you know, since we're talking about workforce and, and younger, um, you know, it, it kind of um, brought a thought um, to me. We currently in OBAC, we we work or we help fund a program up um, up north, um, and it's on the tribal um, colleges. Um, in the summer, um, NSTI, um, you'll forgive me, but I don't remember <laughs> the actual ac ac acronym, but uh, National, uh, I think it's Science Transportation Institute or something like this. We work with um, younger children. They're probably about sixth through eighth grade, and we, we were able to tour it last year. and um, they work on um, kind of, uh, you know, construction projects, working on robots, working on building bridges and, you know, all these things to kind of expose them to the transportation industry. They go on field trips to, you know, look at, you know, you know, concrete being poured and, you know, things like that. But, you know, we have that focused currently um, on those tribal colleges, but, you know, perhaps that's something that um, we as WizDOT as OBAC, you know, could look at seeing if we could, you know, have that type of programming um, elsewhere, right? And I don't know, um, you know, John, you know, and, and you and others who, you know, currently do our HCST program, um, if you work with young children or, you know, younger children or not, but, you know, maybe that's something um, we can certainly um, explore and look into. Um, I see that Joe has his hand up. Yeah, Tanja, real quick. Um, if you're going to do something like that, my suggestion is to get a hold of Dan Webster. Um, mm -hmm. I, I call. Dan is, on, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, I, Dan is a guru um, bringing young people um, into the fold. He's done that uh, since he started with the Wallback Group, one of the larger, one of the big five here in the state of Wisconsin. So I would say bring Dan into that mix and have a conversation since he does represent one of the larger 
um, contractor, and maybe he can help you navigate through that workforce development issue. Right. And 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 just know that it is an idea. <laughs> you, ideas need money. <laughs> I don't have a funding stream um, yet, but I, I think that certainly um, kids, you know, they can't, if they don't see it, they don't know they can do it, right? So um, we really need to expose them. So thank you for the very uh, robust conversation. I appreciate that. We're going to move on to the DBE utilization update. Um, Benji, take it away. Hello, everyone. Okay, so I am going to share my screen here in a millisecond. And I do apologize. Um, I have to get up real quick and shut my office door because apparently there must be a, a leaf or a squirrel outside the window and my dog is letting me know it. Excuse me for a second. Okay. Um, this is the <clears throat> excuse me, utilization report. Um, I want to share right now. This is uh, our DBE attainment report through the April letting. Uh, our May letting is coming up on May 14th. The modifications that are reflected on this particular document are through March 31st, as well as the consultant figures are um, also through March 31st. Our goal is 12.42%. Um, right now, our federal funding for construction and consulting is um, $609 million. Our DBE commitments for consulting are $9.8 million. Our DBE commitments for construction um, year-to-date is um, $61.7 million. And the total consultant and construction commitments um, tally up to $71.6 million. Based on these numbers, our overall DB attainment is 11.76%. I did want to break it down a little bit more for the construction portion of this. At time of let through April, we have um, achieved a 53.7 million, um, 53 million, excuse me, 53.7 million in commitments. Our modifications to date are 8 million just a little bit over 8 million, and that's where we're getting our 61.785 million in commitment. Uh, I do want to let you know that we have our uniform report coming up uh, for the first half of federal fiscal year 24, and the utilization team, the um, all the primes, everybody has been working really well together to get in those um, contract modification or commitment modifications. Um, so this number, our modifications will absolutely go up. We're going to be collecting information for the first half, um, probably through May 15th. We will be submitting those uh, that uniform report on May 30th. Um, it's due June 1st, but that's a Saturday, so we'll be submitting it on that Friday. Farther down on the list right now, we're looking about 825 mil million in construction Fed funds, about 129 million in consultant um, project or design, etc. Fed funds. So we're just under a billion dollars right now in um, Fed funded um, monies towards these projects. My standard issue disclaimer statement is that all numbers are subject to change monthly by letting DBE commitment uh, modifications that have been approved and the federal funding updates. For utilization, I wanna share this with you. Um, right now we have uh, about 900, and this was through um, the end of March. Since it's only May 2nd, the April numbers have not been input into here, um, but through the end of March, we had 901 requests. We had 90 to review, 235 we were processing, 31 um, needed to be signed, and through the end of March, we had already processed 442. And this is where we get our numbers. We had 10 million, over 10 million in increases and 2.6 million in decreases for our current number of uh, just over 8 million in uh, DBE commitment modifications after contract execution. 
Does anyone have any questions on that? Um, John, if you're talking, you're you're muted. No. OK. All right. And then uh, what I wanted to do also then was share um, some breakdowns on some projects. Um, uh, they were talking about the 894 project. We do not have um, that set up yet. Um, the project is relatively new, so we will be going over that um, probably in our next meeting, showing you where the breakout is. But we did have some really good information on, um, you know, what's going on the project, the dollar amounts that it's, you know, we're seeing out there as far as participation. So we'll be able to update you on that uh, for our next meeting. Uh, again, for the 20, uh, for the Highway 20 project, this was a relatively large project. There was 15.12% uh, total consulting, and that was for construction oversight. Um, and we had 43% for Black American and over 57% uh, for non-minority. Workers on the project for construction, we had a DBE goal of 15%. And uh, through all the contract modifications, that pro project achieved 34.57% or over $3.5 million. We do have our breakout here of the um, percentages and the number of contracts of firms participating on that project. And we break it down even further here by showing the um, ethnicity, male, female type of work that's being that was conducted on that project. This project more than likely will be um, fall, will fall off because it is done and I believe we're wrapping up any and all final um, numbers and stuff on this project. So this will probably get replaced by the 94 project. Uh, the zoo. Um, we've talked about the zoo a couple of times today for the um, consultant participation for construction management. 40% was performed by Black American Company and 60% by non-minority. Again, here we have the breakout and breakdown of um, the number of contracts that were on this, the type of firms, ethnicity, and the percentage that they offered um, DBE goal on this project was 15% year to date through our most recent modifications is 18.27% uh, with over 29 million in DBE dollars um, and achievement on that project. We do have the breakdown again for this again by ethnicity, male, female and the type of work that was performed. On the I-43 project, we this is the I-43 corridor. Uh, we just lumped um, the whole corridor together. So we do have an um, average goal of 10.6% that was assigned. Our DBE achievement, including all of these project IDs and all the work that's being done on there, is currently at 15.62% or over um, 64.8 million in DBE participation. And again, as in the previous slides, we're showing the ethnic background, the number of contracts and the percentage and the further breakdown here by ethnicity, male, female, and the type of work being performed. So does anybody have any questions on these? Uh, good morning, Benji. Tim McMurtry from NAMAC. Just a quick question on the the zoo slide. Mm -hmm. Talked about um, African Americans or Blacks perform forty percent, but the three percent is the correlation between the forty percent performance and the three percent. Is that three percent the representative of the total job itself? Or okay, so on this particular slide, good morning, Tim. On this particular slide, this is only about the consultant participation. Okay. So 40% of consultant participation was held by Black American. 
okay. 60% held by non-minority. Okay, so this is just just consultant. Just then consultant. when we move, yeah. Then when we okay. move into um, the zoo, these um, these numbers are by contract. Okay, three percent, mm -hmm. eighteen contracts. Um, what we have to remember is is that a when a DBE firm has a contract say like for trucking, right? We have a, right. a minority trucking company oh. and they in turn hire minorities underneath them. Okay. We can only count the one contribution from the, uh, the initial, okay? Yeah. So there could be more minor, minority trucking firms working on here, but mm -hmm. because we federal regulations state that we can only count that one contract, because right. it is a DBE, um, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily see the actual number of how many uh, uh, minority trucking firms might be out on the job. Yeah, but we do have a reflection of dollar amounts that come out there. I see. So in that particular explanation, just so I understand it, if the one DBE trucking company, OK, they get credit for, OK, we got the DBE, but if they hire, let's say, five or six others that are also minority contractors, even black contractors, that won't necessarily show up, but they still will be on the job. So now you have a total of six or seven, actually, but only credit or recognition, quote unquote, is given to the one. That is correct. <clears throat> That's okay. the, oh, Tondra, if you're trying to talk, you're muted. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, that's how it works. So we do yeah. have we ha do have more firms that are actually working out there, but by the regulations and how we're re to report that DBE participation, mm -hmm. it it does um, the full dollar amount is represented, but the actual potential number of firms that are working out there are not necessarily shown. Got it. And last question, is there any way, I know that for the, I guess, federal re reporting purposes, it only, you know, only one can be counted. Is there another, for lack of a better word, backdoor uh, way to capture the, I'll say, true total above and beyond what the, you know, stipulations are for reporting? Or is that just a, I guess, a, a phantom number that goes unaccounted? Or we do we do um review those numbers on who's working on our projects okay, okay. um mm -hmm. there are certain um reports that we can pull that help us identify who is working on our projects how many people are working on the projects um mm -hmm. but it's kind of painstaking to um to pull every project and do that that whole process. Um, right. But we can um, pull those and uh, we often do just to just to get a, our finger on the pulse, make sure you know we see how many of our um, great DBEs are on our projects. So got it. Understood. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Benji, for those explanations and Tim for the question. Yeah, thank you. Are, are there any more questions for ben Benji? Is that your entire presentation? I don't want to. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Any thank other questions you. for Benji? No. Okay. We will move on. Uh, my apologies. We are we're a bit over, but um, again, I think the questions and conversation have been very very uh, helpful. Um, we will have Maggie at this point um, give us our labor utilization in the southeast region. Thank you, Tanja. Um, good morning, everyone, or almost afternoon. I'd like to share the report with you. Can everyone let me know when you're able to see it? Okay, thank you, Tanja. Let's see here. I'm sorry, I can kind of only see Tanja, but I have turned my camera off to see here. So I will be reporting on the labor data utilization for four of our projects within the Southeast region. And I'll start with the project um, being the Zoo Interchange. That project began in January of 2021. I believe it has wrapped up or should be um, at about at its end now. And so with our, there was only an increase in the total number of employees by two 
employees. There has not been much change in the numbers within this project. There is an increase in the work hours by 209 hours. There is an increase in the total number of minorities within this project by two minorities. And there is an increase in the total number of female work hours by 10 hours in this project. And I will, I'll answer questions on any of the projects uh, following the total report, please. So our next report is on the I-43 North-South Freeway from Brown Street to Capitol. And the total number of employees, there was an increase of 58 employees. There is also an increase of 11,416 total work hours. And there was also an additional increase of 20 minority employees within this project. And as well, an increase of two hours for the total female work hours on the project as well. There were no additional increases. There was a little bit of drop in the minority female work hours. In that project. I'm sorry, a little bit of increase on the minority female hours on that project as well. Our third project here is the State Highway 50 from 75th Street in Kenosha and the Ple Pleasant Prairie area. There's a total increase of 15 hours on the total number of work hours. There was no increase on the total number of employees for this project. There was also no increase in the total number of minorities. And as we see, my apologies, there were no increases in any of the other areas on this project for female workers, minority female hours, or total graduate hours for the HCST program. Our final project that I'll be reporting on is the State Highway 20, Washington Ave in the city of Racine. As Benji did previously mention, the project is wrapping up and will probably be replaced by the 894 project. I'll be having utilization numbers to report on that within our next review. There was no increase in the total number of employees or the total number of work hours. There was a drop with one in one minority worker on that project. And there have been no other changes, so we remain with the 14 at 3% female workers, and we still have the same number of HCST graduate hours within the project. Does anyone have any questions on these? I will be ad adding the report as well, and there is a breakdown as far as the demographic numbers for the minorities on every project as well. No questions for Maggie? Nice. All right. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. For, You're welcome. For that report. We appreciate it. So we will now, this is the time where we go into our breakout sessions. Um, we're a bit over today, so um, we won't have as much time. Um, I think uh, we'll just still only have, we'll, we'll just go for a half an hour until 1145. And so we have our business subcommittee in our labor um, subcommittee. Um, I see that Bruce is not with us, but David is. Um, so David um, and others in the group, I'm sure you'll <laughs> will, will uh, uh, be able to direct and facilitate the conversation for business. And then for the labor, um, Jason is here with us, Jason Johnson and Maggie um, will facilitate those. So- Quick question um, for you, Tanja. Maggie does have a question. Yes, Maggie. Sorry about that. Um, do are we recording this meeting? I noticed that Dan had requested the recording because he's having problem problems logging on. I believe Christina. Yes, yes. you are recording. Yes. Okay. Yes, we are recording, and I'll be jumping into each breakout session to make sure those are being recorded as well. Okay. I just wanted to go through real quick. We don't have many people on labor, so I have Joe Davis, Dan Webster, Josh Johnson. John Anderson and Maggie and myself that are in the labor group. Is there anyone else that needs to be in the labor group? Well, Joe Davis needs to be placed in the business group since I deal specifically with subcontractors and businesses, not labor. Okay. And if you could put me, Andrea Weddle Henning, in the labor group as well. 
Okay. I will change those real quick and then send you off to your meetings. All right. We'll see you all there. There's about 15 of us. There seems about. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, um, in the absence of uh, our chair, I wasn't sure if Dwayne, did you want to fill in or do we want to kind of go forward talking about some of the issues we've talked in the past, just kind of update those or how do we want to proceed? Okay, well, <clears throat> I'll certainly try and pinch hit for Bruce a little bit. Uh, Bruce is, uh, sends his apologies. He's locked up with an audit trying to get some things done for for that right now. Um, maybe just a little bit of a question to the group. Uh, we've just gotten an update, had some good discussions and things, and what are people's reactions to what we've just been talking about? With the with the full group. Uh, anything that uh, look to be positives, any things that are of concern to folks. Um, I don't know, uh, Tim McMultrie, can I ask you, put you on the spot? <laughs> All righty then. Mr. DJ, uh, sure. I mean, I, I thought that the 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 meeting was great. It's always great to hear about the news of the meeting or even exceeding of the DBE goals. I think one of the things that, um, and this kind of you know, I'm kind of Johnny come lately relative to some of the other folks that have been part of this particular group for a number of years. I've just been with NAMAC since December of 2022, so a year and some change. So I'm still, you know, kind of kicking the tires a bit, getting fully acclimated. But from my understanding, part of the genesis of this group even being created was to be able to make sure that um, ethnic minority uh, contractors both on the consultant side as well as you know the uh, construction side you know had a, had a had a voice had an opportunity really to share you know some of the things that you know could use some improvement and it seems like WISDOT has taken a lot of those things to heart and have been making a valiant effort to to move the needle i think one of the things that you know we want to continue to you know, monitor and amplify and maximize when we can is as the numbers of DBEs uh, are being met, are increased, goals being exceeded, we want, I think, building a bit more equity around it. It still appears as if, you know, non-ethnic minorities are getting the lion's share of the contracts. Let's say, for example, on the consultant side, let's say that, you know, Tim McMurtry, you know, consulting, I'm the engineering final design place, I'm appreciative of, you know, the contracts that I'll get, let's say $60,000, $70,000. But if there are, you know, multiple multi-million dollar opportunities as well, I would like to get some of those too. So that, you know, I know that WISDOT might not be able to say, okay, you get this contract, you get this contract, you know, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. But as at the end of the day, what happens is you have this kind of cascading impact. And what I mean by that is, is if I have a number of employees and, you know, they're rock stars, I would like to be able to pay them. I pay them by the contracts that I get. So if I go for this contract, that's, you know, 300,000 or this contract that's 1.2 million or this contract that's three or 4 million and I have capacity to do it but I miss out on that one. Okay, you can't win them all, cool. I go for another one. I don't get that one. I go for another one. I don't get that one. So let's say for the five or six contracts I go after, all of them ranging from, let's say, 300,000 to 5 million, and I only get the $300,000 ones, and I get one of those out of the six or seven I went through over the year or two, I'm now going to start to atrophy my staff because I can't keep them on board. They're going to jump ship to 
another place that can maybe pay them more because I can't get the bigger contract. So the importance of us being able to ensure that ethnic minority contractors get contracts too, not just because they're ethnic minorities, but they have the capability to do the work, quality work, let them eat as, as well. So I think that that is the one thing that we try to keep our pulse on at NAMAC, not just to be uh, thorns in the flesh, so to speak, but really to ensure that there's equity here, because if the goals are still being met, but if it's white women owned firms that are the ones that get the lion's share. So it's, it's great that the goal has been met, but I don't know if that gets fully to the spirit of what the DBE program is about. You know what I'm saying? Because the ethnic minority firms are still starving on the vine and we don't want that. And so not to be in nobody's wallet or anyone's wallet, it if there is a way, be it WISDOT really, you know, holding the the crimes, you know, feet to the fire and or insisting that, OK, you know what, we're going to roll with uh, ethnic minority firm for this prime opportunity because they've been in the game for a while. We've seen the work that they've done. They've got the capacity. They've got 10, 20, 25 inputs. They, they can do it. Let's give them more of these bigger contracts because if they always get the lesser amount contracts, it doesn't help them to grow. You know what I'm saying? So that would be, you know, the one thing. So it's kind of like we got, you know, the, the, the great news of maintained and increased DBE goal attainment that definitely ought to be applauded. But the question becomes, can we, are there any other areas room for improvement so that it's wins all across the board and not kind of a lopsided situation? That would be the one thing I would, you know, just kind of say. So, so Tim, maybe just asking you, and I'm, I'm kind of going down a path right now. I, mm -hmm. I know a little bit, um, a little bit and you get removed from things, but are we seeing the information <clears throat> that we need listening to you at the firm level for construction or consulting? Uh, the labor, I really like the labor charts that Benji was showing. Uh, mm -hmm. It kind of showed the, the different categories and things. And uh, do we likewise, when we look at the 9.8 million in DBE consulting, for example, or uh, the, the dollars of, of contracting, are we seeing that in firm kind of firm numbers uh, by in the different categories. Uh, I, again, you're kind of talking about ethnic versus non-ethnic, which kind of raises the issue of women or um, so forth. But is, is that what you're getting at, looking at that information? Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I, think, I, I think so. I think one of the things that, I mean, again, I mean, I applaud WISDOT for really doing their best to acquiesce to whatever has been brought to them. Um, you know, I, we consider WISDOT, you know, partners, you know what I'm saying? So yep. they're, they're, they're jamming. I think if because I think some of the charts that, again, I'm one of the Johnny come lately to the show, but it seems like the information that is being shared now is more than what was shared previously. And as we are continuing on in the spirit of cooperation, I think one of the other things that can maybe help get specifically to what I was just kind of delineating is if there was a chart that showed, OK, these are the dollar amounts of the contract awards for the top three firms, top three white women owned firms on the final design consultant side or the construction side. Uh, the top three contracts awarded to ethnic minority firms, and we'd be able to see 
if all of the white women owned firms got all of the contracts that are in excess of 500,000 or more and all of the you know ethnic minority owned firms got all of the contracts that were less than 500,000 it shows this is what the disparity is now the other thing that we'd have to get into is does the lower awarded contract firm do they have the capacity to get some of the higher numbers and i don't know what that formula or matrix is but if there is a formula or matrix that does that the question becomes why aren't some of the ethnic minority firms getting more of those bigger contracts why do they always have to be relegated to the lower amounted ones if they have the capacity to do the bigger ones and okay. if that is a disparity that is that clear now since we are about solutions okay what's the solution to this what's the way that we can fix this so that as we are having our celebratory conversations given credit certainly where credit is due not only that we also identify some areas where we collectively thought that needed some improvement and we work together to improve that so now if you started out with 10 areas that needed improvement okay we tackled one now we only have nine we tackled two more. Now we only have seven. After a while, hey man, we whittled it down from 10 areas that needed improvement. We addressed those. We only got one. The moonshot is, hey, we have no areas that need improvement. Okay. We are batting a thousand everywhere. Is, okay. is, is, is what Tim, if I could jump jump in here and things. Uh, we've got a couple of people with hands up and stuff, but... Okay. Um, I want to give uh, the WISDOT people a chance to kind of react a little bit, and then we'll go to Joe Davis. Uh, Benji's got her hand up a couple times. I'm not sure if she's the one that's going to speak to this or if if Tondra or David or Ty or, or Bob or Marquise or other folks on there want to chime in. Okay, so, real – oh. Tondra, do you care if I go first? Yes, you can go first. I'm sorry, what? You can go first. Go okay. ahead, Benji. Go ahead. Thank Benji. you. So, Tim, great points, but there's some things that um, are some major factors that are involved with this. Um, okay. Number one, to be considered on a whether it's construction management or design, especially if you are trying to go for a larger dollar amount. Number uh -huh. one, you have to be on the roster of eligible consultants. And that means you have to go through the full process of being submitting your CFR, your consultant report, et cetera, et cetera. So we do not have that many uh, minority firms who have taken that leap, who have expressed, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. So yeah. in order to participate, you have to set yourself up to be able to participate. OK, um, yeah. so that's one of the biggest factors that might um, it's not WISDOT holding anyone back in that respect. If you're not if you don't put yourself in that lane, you're not going to be able to participate. OK, so yeah. we have wonderful guides we've established that are going to be, you know, available to consultants and contractors coming up here pretty soon on what those processes are um but it's also all that information is available on the west uh, website okay um wow. even coming in as a subcontractor there are limits to what a non uh, firm that is not on the uh, roster can pursue um bob is it what seventy five thousand for the contract or something for a sub yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't. I mean, it's a yep, it's sorry. a really low number, so it would behoove whoever is interested in you know being able to to pursue and obtain those big contracts to actually do the work they need to do to put themselves in that position. Okay, so yeah. that's one solution right there. The onus goes back on the people who want to do the work. They have mm -hmm. to do the work to get the work. Okay. Got it. So, now, on, on that on that note, Benji. Is, yeah. is there a difference for the the whole, you know, you got to play to win, you got to get in the game to get into the mix. Is there a differentiation between the requirements on the contracting side and the consulting side for those folks to become eligible because some of them might already be in the mix? I, 
as far as I'm sorry, I'm not sure I totally understand your question. Yeah, I kind of conflated a couple of things. On the contracting side, yeah. you mentioned the, the $75,000 limit threshold for subcontractors. No, is consultants. That, that's on the consultant side, not the contracting side, construction side. Right. Got it. So okay. for an individual that's new to the game, they have to put themselves through, submit all of the requisite information to be considered. Now, if there is a firm that's already in the mix, that already has that, that checks all the boxes that are already an existing firm or mm -hmm. firms, what is the challenge there? Well, I guess I'll let you finish your point. The, well, I'll... the challenge there is, is that on the consultant side, it is based on uh, their QBS selections. Okay. All right. So you have to, beyond a shadow of a doubt, prove that you are the best candidate and the best representative for the state to perform construction management or perform on these design contracts. There's a lot of, oh goodness gracious, there's a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, it is, you've got white male owned firms who mm -hmm. go up against other white male firms, minorities, whoever, and they are as they're qualified to do the work, they don't get the job. So it is whoever is the best qualified for that job. They don't, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's QBS, quality yeah. based selection. Is um, there the, any room for just one, one last question? I won't interrupt you anymore, ahead. Benji. Is there any room for subjectivity on the QBS? piece let's say all things being considered all things being equal hey you got this you got that you check this you check that all of the metrics for the qbs both of them are lights out i Does, would is have there to anywhere defer. where a final decision just says you know what on my own volition i'm gonna pick a over b i can't speak to that because i'm not part of the QP, qbs process yeah. um i don't know bob or if you know you yeah. could po possibly yeah. provide a yeah. little info on that one yeah so tim the the dbe program works it's not an mbe program right it's a dbe mm -hmm. program yeah. um here at southeast region we we've, we've tried to instill a, a culture of of removing the, the equity lens and and being able to um look at all of all, all the uh, TV firms in in regards to equity and and being able to do that. So one of the things though that we do look at is capacity, and uh, we 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 really try to um, have our project managers um, look at new firms, um, work with new firms, um, because it, it's really sometimes it's really easy for them to just you know stay with the same old same old but that's not our culture here at southeast region we we really try to kind of uh, work with our project managers to help them understand that we want to spread the work out um a little bit more equitable and um taste take a little bit of risk once in a while on a, maybe a firm that uh hasn't either done work here or hasn't done work for a while or something like that or is new to the game um but has uh shown some capacity um again yeah uh quality based selection is based on their ability to do the work not necessarily that they're the maybe the the best or the best interviewers or the best it, it, it's whether they um have the ability and 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 personnel to do that um um do that work so um i i think what you're hitting on is uh and what we've been trying to do here in the southeast region is making sure that um our our, our project managers um when they do view the the uh nois um that yeah kind of take a look at that yep um, we've got about 10 minutes left and I want to keep things moving along and Tondra, could I hold you off for a minute and let's, uh, Joe Davis has been sitting there. I know he's still hobbled from the Achilles and things, but, uh, he's kind of 
waddled you're his wrong. way up to the front of the line. You're wrong, Dwayne. But you know, I still love you, man. <laughs> yeah. you know, look, I, look, I I just celebrated my 36th year in the construction industry. Proud member of Local 601, you know, and now with the operators. So I want to share out of experience what I've what I've come to know. Uh, these two and a half years I've been with CBG. We have a capacity problem with DBEs. It's just, it, 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 it's that way, whether we like it or not. And the capacity shouldn't have to be with that problem to build capacity and subcontractors. It really is, and, and, and I'll structure this based upon my comment. Uh, it really is about if you're interested in becoming part of the industry, you got to be a student of the industry. And what I mean by that is that you have to know the processes internally that WISDOT require, um, not that we might want them to do, but they're a regulatory body. All this federal funding that they get from FHWA and USDOT is subject by them playing by the rules. And so some of the things that I do with some contractors that I work with is take them on the WISDOT site and let them understand the process prior to these contracts being let creating these relationships. If there is a master contract schedule that is out there, that gives you a pretty much a range of how much that project is going to be. And then when the advertisement comes out, the advertisement will tell you exactly what work is to be performed. But the question is, is that do you have the necessary capital in order for you to be part of some of the larger projects? Because the capital is important. You know, sometimes these primes and you know, I, 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 I work with uh, our members of WTBA and we speak on a regular basis. They can build capacity in a DBE, but the DBE has to come with some capacity in order for them to increase. And that's important. So as we, as, as we start building out the data that Benji talked about, what I see is a capacity issue for DBEs to do either $100,000 worth of contracts or $500,000 worth of contracts and a million dollars worth of contracts because you have to have that labor force in order for you to do that, but you also have to have the capital. And most importantly, you gotta have bonding. Otherwise, if, if a DBE gets in, into liquidated damages and Dwayne, you've been around and how liquidated damages can be the kiss of death for a small firm. Um, that comes with debarment and all of those other things. We have to be very strategic on how we continue to build capacity in those DBEs. And everybody's not going to have the mindset, a business acumen to grow as a DBE. So we have to be very, very conscious of those who are in the pipeline. And I'll be very specific now, ethnically. Um, I've been working up in Indian country, and I've been working with chairman, tribal chairman. And they put things together through CDFIs and through Bay Bank and all of those other things to give contractors access to capital. In the African-American community, that whole ecosystem needs to be developed because in Southeastern region, it's very competitive in the African-American contracting space, whether you're a trucker or whether you know, you're, you're an excavator. I'm not talking about the engineering side, but as a contractor. So you really have to, number one, build capacity in yourself. Number two, understand how you submit accurate price quotes because you can't be selective if you're 15, 20, 30% over what your competitor is because honestly, that comes out of the prime contractor's pocket because he's already submitted a bid on what to do the work for. So when they open up the bids and they select their particular DBE subcontractors, it's important for everybody to know that They've selected that person that, that gave them a reasonable price quote, not a certain bid, but a price quote. So I, I'll stop there, Dwayne, because I don't want to take up the time. But this is where I've been focusing on, and CBG has been focusing on, making sure that we build real capacity in subcontractors so they're able to graduate and take enough of the work that they do so they don't overextend themselves and end up uh, uh, getting themselves in trouble on some of these projects. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Very, very good points. Um, coming back to Tandra. Yes, I'll, I'll try to be quick because we have just a couple minutes. Um, I know Benji spoke um, primarily to the uh, consulting side, but I just want to say uh, 
with that, we signed on to the equity and infrastructure project. I think I spoke of that um, quite a few months ago in meetings. Um, and the goal there is to uh, level the playing field by getting more DBEs to be prime. So, you know, if you're the prime, you're going to make the prime money, right? Those are the big dollars. Um, and as we in WSDOT, um, we have tried to, you know, kind of go down that journey to, to help DBEs um, become more primes. There's a lot of work um, that is involved in um, being able to be a prime. Um, and we put the feelers out there. Who wants to be a prime? Like at our, our annual event, um, and you know, elsewhere, we've been reaching out to those who we feel like maybe have capacity. And we're finding that the DBEs are saying that they don't want to be prime. <laughs> they would prefer to be a subcontract just because of all the work. Um, those who are ready right now to be prime, who are signed up and could prime certain projects, we found six of them. Right. There's six of them in the WSDOT database, and mostly they are white women, right? So I guess I'm I'm putting it out there to you all just to say, you know, we need help in strategizing around this so that we can encourage and, and um, you know, try to grow our DBs with the mindset of being a prime. Um, and I also want to point out, I think at our last meeting, um, I showed some data, of, and I believe this was around construction as well, you know, over the last five, six years, and thank you, Tim, for saying and recognizing the success that we've had, but we've mm -hmm. also had success in, in decreasing the amount of uh, contracts that the white women-owned businesses get. Um, in the early, about 2018 was around 70%, and I think we're currently at about, you know, 45 to 50% or something like that. So um, things we're doing, are, they are working, maybe not as fast as we like, um, and we certainly don't control it <laughs> because the primes choose whom they want, right? But we have certainly tried to grow our DBEs um, so that they are networking, so that they are uh, performing quality work, and so that they get selected um, on these projects. So, 1143. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, may I, uh, <clears throat> David, may I take my facilitator hat off for just a second? Go ahead, please. Okay. I, I just want to say a couple things. This is really good discussion to begin with, and it, it seems like from years at DOT and now on the consultant side, it's you're juggling all these different balls and trying to kind of work your way through them, and um, it's a little bit chaotic because they don't all align all at the same time, but there are so many positives and things that are out there. I think whether it be construction or it be on the consulting side, uh, the mentor-mentee efforts, um, you know, prior to the more refreshing the, the overall effort, uh, but certainly since um, Andy Kowski mentioned we're working with uh, them formally and things and kind of helping us develop our staff. Because as you build your business, you need to build your capabilities and things along the way of the staff uh, on the consulting side. And I think it's probably the same thing on the construction side. So um, that that's out there. Um, again, keeping people busy, taking on more responsibilities and things. That That's the goal that's out there. So, you know, per Perhaps if we can find a way to stretch how we're looking at uh, the information and presenting it in the meetings. So we've we've got those firm numbers for both construction firms on the DBE end. We're kind of dividing those down and then on the consultant side as well. Uh, the more we can slice and dice that, I think that's helpful in things. But there there are really good things happening here. And at the same time, there are plenty and plenty, plenty of challenges. Thank you. In, anybody else want to jump in here? It looks like my uh, clock says uh, 1145 here, but Christina's not come back to pull us back to the larger group. Just so you know, Dwayne, we did request five extra minutes. We don't know if she saw it, but trying. <laughs> oh, OK, OK. Um, Matt Grove, um, 
the construction side, the industry standpoint, uh, any any feedback, uh, any words of wisdom from your chair? Hi, Duane. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hi, Ty. We haven't had a chance to meet yet. Um, nice to meet you. We. Uh, Hi, Matt. Sorry, I've been in and out all day, so <laughs> a lot of issues brewing. But um, I think things are up and running earlier than than typical which is a good thing because that's usually a direct function of uh, how things go at the end of the year. And like Joe mentioned earlier, that the uh, concerns about <clears throat> finishing projects and liquidated damages and things like that. So it's a good sign. Now we're fingers crossed for good weather moving forward, but um, that's always a, that's always the main factor. But I think in general, things are, things are pretty good. There's, there's work out there. I mean, We've heard a lot of talk, obviously, about all the uh, additional funding. I don't know if I'd call it that we're we're super heavy in in work. There's um, quite a bit more local work than there's been in the past through the LRIP and and ARIP programs. Significantly more that, and that's non DOT let work. That's locally let work. So um, uh, we'll see how that goes and how the delivery of all those projects works, but um i think we're optimistic in the future there's good bipartisan support for funding and that, that seems to continue we, we continue to go down that road and that's that's huge but um uh, inflation is not helping you guys i mean that's that's uh certainly has had an impact on everyone so other than that i don't have a lot of a lot of comments it's early and we're just just getting rolling and trying to stress safety um even though you know even within this group i think we should always everyone should always talk about that a little bit in the big picture that you know you don't need to be a safety expert expert to send a safety message i think the the messaging is more important than anything just to remind people whether you're working on a job or whether you're on a on a highway project or whether you're working at home or whatever you, sometimes you take that for granted and things can change in a hurry for you and we don't want to we don't want to see that so it's really important but um, other than that, I don't have a lot. Um, maybe just thinking ahead, uh, we're going to have to do a report out, I think. Uh, and uh, again, I think we kind of talked about building capacity and then looking at uh, how, we're, how we're dividing and looking at the data. Um, for firms, whether it be design or construction, making sure the firms have uh, both opportunities to grow their capabilities, uh, but they have opportunities to grow their, their capacity. Um, construction seems to be uh, uh, off, getting off to a good start this year, listening to to Matt, um, I think he made a very important point, inflation, that kind of eats into some of the funding opportunities and things that are out there. And then a very good point about, about safety. So um, I'll ask uh, Joe and Tim, uh, you guys both jumped in. Does that summary kind of give an adequate update of what we were talking about? Yes, sir. Yep. OK, OK. Anybody else? I think we're getting ready to go back. Yeah, I see Christian. Yep. Is there hand? I just popped on just to make sure I wasn't like cutting you guys off in any deep, intense conversation. So I will be closing the groups Great. right now. OK, David, would you like me to give the update? Yeah, that'd be awesome if you could. Thank you. OK, good. Thank you, everyone. You are welcome. Thank you. Great job. Long time, so. Yeah, it's good to see all you guys. Good to it see is. you, Josh. And good mm -hmm. to see everyone, too. Big good to see you, John. Yeah, how you doing, John? Oh, hanging in there, doing well. Yeah, yeah it seems like you hanging over there. Yeah, I'm hanging. Just hanging, hanging. comfortably hanging. Ah, <laughs> like that cat you see on the wall with the nails in there, but I'm just saying, hang in there. I'm just hanging in. <laughs> So I do have the um, labor breakout 
goals document that we had started. So it was already in place when I rolled into my role as labor development specialist. So we pretty much have just been adding to it since last year. The last thing that we did in the last meeting was I just, we, we kind of all within our breakout group went through the, we'd previously gone through the goals and we tried to pick two goals. If I remember correctly, John, we tried to pick two goals to focus on specifically. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm going to share that document just so we can all kind of see what's going on here. Can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so the main focus that we got to was in regards to the objective of find, well, the goal is to increase the labor force hiring and workforce diversity on the WISTOP projects. And the objective was to find and recruit good talent. So we made some updates, just different things that we could do as far as reaching out to the military veteran service organization, um, exploring different training programs, connecting with contractors to determine what charges could cause restrictions as far as the have, having people from the program working with them, like the driver's license, things of that nature that could be a barrier to the participants. Let's see. Um, we had also looked into finding out the minimal requirements for the trade unions. I did not receive that information yet, but I can wrap, circle back around on that email I sent out. And then communicating and developing a relationship with PO officers. So I did have a touch base meeting with um, Dan in regards to how how the reentry program works that he is working on as far as with the tribal entities. We have not been able to set anything up, but I actually am kind of excited with um, the welcoming of our new chief for the DBE, Ty Fleming, because she does have a background in DOC. So maybe there's some connections that can be made in that area, or maybe she can kind of point us in the right direction. You know, you know, one of, one of the things, Maggie, I want to throw out there. So well, you all know, I, I obviously I don't I don't have the background that Ty has unless Ty did 10 years in prison like I did. She probably has it on the other side of it. I have it on I have it on the inside of it. She has it you on the, the other experience. side of it. <clears throat> That's but no, what you um, say, Joshua. Huh? What'd you say, Andrea? I said, I don't know. That's what you say. <laughs> but no, so. One of the things that I think we should add on here is the Community Reintegration Center down here in Milwaukee. So they've been doing some engagement. Chantel Jewell um, runs that, and she's been doing some engagement recently that I've seen where they're bringing folks in and having conversations. She really is trying to get workforce. This might be a great opportunity for employers to engage. They're doing welding in there right now. That's all iron that's iron work. That's some of the other work that's being done around welding. So that's, you know, um, whether any of the pipe trades, any of the um, pile drivers. So, you know, any of the pile drivers, any of the carpentry work. So thinking about getting connected and that's a connection that I can make as well. I'm personal friends with Chantel and I've been seeing her post lately and I'm like, wait a minute now. <clears throat> These are the things like first and foremost, my passion has always been how do we get individuals engaged prior to release, getting them in apprenticeship programs. And I, I really, I put money behind that, I put money where my mouth was and put grant money behind it when I was a state director. But this is an area that is truly untapped. And when I say untapped, I mean untapped. It isn't a focus I don't know if, if David Polk, I don't know how much of a focus he has on it, right? Obviously, I have a focus because I'm formerly incarcerated, so I'm like, there's tremendous value here. But there is, they're having conversations, unfortunately, with the POs. That's a tough conversation because many of them are, they're already, they have too many people, they're overtasked. But I think engaging with that, the community reintegration center from that top and saying, we want to bring employers in. How do we get individuals connected? Because if they have any component of work release at the CRC as well, they can be going and working on these projects. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's a great pipeline. You know, one, you, you you just don't even, you know, we weren't really talking about that. And I think that that's wonderful, uh, a wonderful step in the right direction, Josh. 
Yeah, a lot of people are don't they don't think about it, right? The, it's the the individuals incarcerated are totally forgotten about. They're you know though those folks and individual with disabilities are totally forgotten about when we're talking about recruitment into construction. It's just it's it's crazy to think. But what's so funny is like on the on the incarceration side, that's what they prepare you for is to get out and work with your hands. Like that's what they feel like your worth is just to go out and work with your hands. Well, you could turn that into a lucrative six figure career with ease. But yeah, I'd be willing to make that connection if anybody yeah. else isn't connected to her already. I'm not connected to her. I had not heard of the program at all, but I definitely understand how important of an opportunity it it is to strengthen that relationship. I do. I have a brother as well that's in prison. Um, he is wrapping up about a six year sentence, but um, he went in with no, you know, plan or idea on life, obviously. And he since has gained his welding certificate. He is coming out to a well-paying job better than he'd ever had before. <laughs> his focus, I mean, I, I just feel like it's so important to provide these resources to everyone because if, if you don't have a means for something for you to do when you are um, back in society, there's a higher chance of creating the same mistakes that could possibly lead you back. So why not push in that area to just to Agreed. make the opportunities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would say, I was, yeah, that's that's beautiful um, message. Yeah. Uh, I would just say too, since we're kind of thin on the the um, labor committee, it would be nice to see if, and I know probably Chantel is real busy uh, over here at the county, but mm. it would be nice to have her on the um, on our labor committee. Um, I it think would bringing Good that yes. that that um, you know discussion of incarceration and. And, and bringing Ooh, them, yes. you know, changing the lives to me is a, a big, big story. So if we could get Chantel to come on and help us, um, and because I'm sure she's seeing a different light that we may not be seeing mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as far as DOT and just the needs. You know, we're looking at kids, get, you know, now these are adults, you know, that have been uh, here uh, on this, you know, working and, and doing things. So it would be it would be great to see if she's able to to join us. That's so, a great uh, idea. Uh, so I'm going to, can y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to third, third that. I don't know, it needs a third, but uh, Chantel is definitely cool people. I've worked with her over the years, and I think she would be a great addition to this group. Um, uh, I kind of alluded to something that Tandra, you know, mentioned when she, you know, made reference to exploring the DOT and STI and, you know, expanding things. And, and she kind of made that statement like, well, but you know, you got to have money to do this, that, and the third, which, which, which is a real thing. And that's my segue to say this. So currently at the Racine Youthful Correctional Facility. Yep, that's and another one. At, um, which we call RIOC. And RIOC. then at RCI, which is the Racine Correctional Institution. Um, on what is today? Today is Thursday. On Wednesday, we just had a graduation of 18 individuals who got their high school diploma and their uh, MC3, which is a multi-core craft. Uh, it's a construction related curriculum. So in partnership with Literacy Services of Wisconsin, DOC, WRTP, we're doing a hybrid 509 HSCD program within the correction center. So when these gentlemen come out, they're going to have uh, their high school diplomas and they're also going to have their industry recognized credentials and be on an apprenticeship pathway. Um, that was that program is able to be provided currently because the Department of Corrections applied for funding and got a grant. So mm. the reason I'm saying this and I'm saying it in this way, the 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 desire is there and I'm sure the capacity would be there if let's say we wanted to bring HSCT into the correction space but i know someone's gonna pop up and say who's gonna pay for it so i kind of wanted to start with the with the first thing last and end on the last thing because we've got the people who can provide the training there's already some things pilot projects that demonstrate that you know it can be conducted within the facility doc hired a construction instructor who's from the trades to be their construction instructor 
uh, and, uh, I'm here, I'm sorry, here in Racine. And then also they're contracting or subbing with uh, Gateway Technical College. So it's possible for the HCST training to be delivered within. I just think we'd have to find out, you know, who are who, you know, is it the, the education director? Is it the wardens? And then I guess, again, it's going to go back to that who's going to pay for what thing. But I just want to throw it out there that to Josh's point, uh, there is great training welding. There's different things happening and they're going to come out and they're going to have what, you know, a lot of transferable skills that could go right into the trades. But if if DOT wanted to take the lead to have HSCT in, you know, that space, WRTP, uh, I'm sure, I mean, I won't speak for forward services, but I'm sure the other providers, I know we would, would be open to doing that, you know, if that kind of partnership could be created and leveraged. Um, I, I'm just going to say, I know it could work. So I'm going to be quiet. 100%. <clears throat> it 100% could work. And all it is is a connection. So there's funding. You know, I don't know, John, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know much about Wisconsin Apprenticeship anymore about the you know how everything's been going you know what the goals are how everything's set up I, i'm totally disconnected I'm, I'm more connected to the rest of the country than i am to wisconsin so i don't know if they he's been putting money out for pre-apprenticeship programs but hc hcst is a certified pre-apprenticeship program and because it is it, yes, it does it become is. eligible for funding that if david has within the bureau of apprenticeship standards so that's so when you're talking about funding i think the conversation really is having talking to Ben Jones, who's the education coordinator. He's the lead education coordinator for DOC and having a conversation with him about how do you bring that curriculum to a prison or to a specific prison. And in Ryak, I don't know if he's connected with. I don't think Ben is that, uh, connected with Ryak. Ben, the, ben, it's youth. Ben uh, <coughs> moved around. So I don't know. Oh, who's Ben Jones doing. moved. OK, he, he so just, yeah, he, whoever... just, he, he was the lead of our committee for this pilot project. And then uh, most recently, I got one of those emails. So I'm not sure who okay. if they've even put someone to replace him yet. But um, I, I'm with you, though, I, and I could help. Try to so find why don't we out do something instead of people. so instead of diving, because, John, let's find some time for me and you to talk a little bit more and see if we can just brainstorm around and maybe help you come up with idea, and I'm willing to just brainstorm it just to see what we can come up with. I'll provide but, that John, consultation there. I would love to. And there was one more thing I wanted to mention subject to the veterans uh, service organization. So uh, I had a conversation um, with um, Napoleon Hardy. He's one of the, um, he used to be, oh, sorry, I was going to say DVOP. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all, I don't want to use acronyms. He used to be an employment special training specialist and he now he got promoted but he's still he's still engaged with helping any veterans employed and he he and i have developed a pretty good relationship since i've come over here to Racine. so we speak very candidly and um you know his position was these uh veterans they come out and they are looking for kind of immediate employment they're not really digging the whole go through some training you know, registered. For, I mean, it's like they need a job like yesterday versus, you know, go get on apprenticeship pathway, things of that nature. Um, and I can appreciate what I mean, it works when it works and it works for who it works with. But the point I'm going to make is that I'm almost feeling like um, the conversation needs to happen at a higher level. I can't remember the lady's name right now, but she's like the a total administer for the whole veterans. It's like the secretary of veterans affairs or something. Um, I'm almost thinking that we need to elevate our conversation to that next, that senior level, because, you know, boots on the ground, no disrespect. Their kind of, their focus is more solving immediate needs and other things. And, and there wasn't really the kind of a uh, motivation i thought i mean it was basically like yeah i'll share your information <laughs> no problem yeah you know we we tell we we share your stuff all the time about the training but at the same time our, our people are saying you know they need to go to work today and you're saying they gotta go and apply with the laborers and then they gotta hunt and then they got you know so um i think 
We just need to get buy-in from senior leadership as to what is a, you know, how, what can DOT, how can those two entities merge for the benefit of getting more veterans into a career? I think it's okay. Anyway, so that's my two cents. That's my report out of, I did have a cursory conversation with a person who I like and respect. And um, his sentiment was, his comeback to me was kind of make me felt like maybe you not the person we ought to be talking to. So I'm gonna leave it right there. Thank you for that, John. I did also want to mention too, in regards to funding, that I will be attending a um, another HCWP grant opportunity through the Federal Highway Administration. There's a webinar this afternoon um, where we can apply and hopefully be able to receive up to, I believe, there's a minimum of three hundred thousand per applicant of the program. Um, and WSDOT is looking into applying for that. So hopefully we'll be able to gain more funds and the funds are granted for the HCWP pro program, Highway Construction Workforce Partnership. And we generally, um, our main focus within that partnership is the HCST program. So that's what has the pilot program currently running and that's being led by the Workforce Development Boards and Employee Milwaukee in partnership with our um, HCST providers, John, with WRTP, Forward Service, and the tribal entities. So we may have some more funds in the near future and I think that it would be smart for them to be um, dedicated or allocated to certain areas, re-entry area and or veterans, something that'll help us, um, you know, kind of not end up with like dead end conversations yeah. and initiatives and ideas. Agreed. Agreed. So I'll, be, I'll be listening in on that um, in a few hours today. And I also did attend the Federal Highway State Peer Exchange in regard to the strategic workforce development. And I listened to a lot of great ideas from other states. So I'll be kind of getting those notes all put together. That was just last week. Um, we returned on Thursday, but I'll be getting those notes together and um, trying to find some focus points from within what other states have done. There were, I do, I do know that um, in Ohio, for example, they don't have an actual HCST training that is provided by providers. What they do is their contractors implement the HCST training and the apprenticeship. So it's kind of like the individuals who are attend are not only receiving this training, but they're also being paid on the spot for on the job training. Mm. I do know in a lot of ways that helps with with uh, adults. You know, different states did some. It it was amazing the takeaway information from that. Um, three-day workshop because different states are doing different things. I will say that I will say that Wisconsin has a little bit more of an advancement as far as our program and our num what our numbers reflect. I do know some, um, Ohio did say that it was a little bit hard as far as getting contractors to do this on the job training. You know, they were having a little less numbers as far as successful turnout within the program, but Still different things to take into consideration. So Maggie, I mm -hmm. have my hand raised there just I'm like, sorry, you do. Sorry. It's all, no, it's all good. Um I don't know, because I know we're like we're the labor committee and I know what we do. So if I'm if I am uh conflating things, you just tell me, John, no, that oil and water, these two things should not come together. But um I'm, I could take a wild guess that you probably knew uh, that my inquiry around interns has directly proportional to the pilot um, program as we are seeking some some internship placement for those participants who are going through that training. But now that I think about it and about what we're trying to accomplish over here, maybe part of our strategy should be how do we leverage the pilot or how do we leverage things that are happening you know I'm, I'm one to never one recreate the wheel and two if there's already money on the table and 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 and, and we're in it whether we know it or not or you know if we're connected tangentially then maybe it's just us figuring out how do we then leverage it 
for this group. So I'm just kind of putting that out there, spitballing and saying, you know, what you think about that, what y'all think. And do you mean as far as resources for the specific pilot? Yeah, I'm great. Hold on one sec. That's okay, John. Sorry, y'all. Um, say that one more time, Maggie. Were Were you speaking in regards to resources for the so that the pilot program can continue, or resources moving them into internship from M the pilot? So, kind of both. But right. you know, the nice thing about the whole internship word is that because there's there's another funding stream this doesn't cost it's not going to cost employers anything it's like a worksite experience is really what mm -hmm. they're going to be providing so um and that's that's the current iteration and maybe you know i don't know if we take that to another level or what have you but i was just thinking that if our role here is to educate and develop and you know get more you know labor and union representatives participation and you know again trying to <laughs> work it from the inside out i'm like well let's say hey let's market the, the other things that are happening with the pilot and the training and the, and, and use it maybe you know someone out here uh, contractor might be more persuaded to engage in something like that than when you say, hey, can you take on an apprentice full time? You know, can you add someone to your labor force? Sometimes they're reluctant and they start talking about, oh, I got, I got, my, we're full. What do you want me to put, put a guy on the bench for you or whatever? So if, if we're saying, well, hey, we've got people who are going through approved certified pre-apprenticeship program, we've got some folks. We just want you to be able to take them out on as an intern uh, so they can gain a work experience. You know, I don't know. Maybe it just adds weight to to everything we're doing. So again, I'm just and kicking, it, I'm kicking it around. It, that would be wonderful if that wonderful if that was something too that could be um wrapped into or incorporated into the HCST training. But I'm definitely making note of everything. I don't you know, I don't always know if I have the right contacts or the right tie-ins to the right people, but as long as I take the notes, I bring these things up at every meeting, I'm going to find the right person somehow. So, John, my question to you is, um, yes, DLT has the internships, you know, they have the co-ops. Have any of your um, interns had the opportunity to intern in the capacity that they talked about today as far as with uh, DLT? They said they had 20 or 30 interns. Um, is there a connection already with that? It doesn't sound like it, is it? No, we're it's, okay. it's, it's, it's a work in progress. We're trying to develop right now. We're okay. reaching out to various DOT contractors to engage them to take on individuals, which is why I was kind of trying to make some connections today to do mm -hmm. some my own little outreach um, because we're, we're, we're working diligently. I think we've got maybe one concrete contractor who's mm -hmm. said okay. yes, but I don't know. And I could, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add this in, John. I could be wrong, but I think that's something that we would want to bring back up or broach again with our entire group. Because, yeah, we are on the labor breakout end of things, but a lot of the contractors and whatnot are on the business side of the breakout. And, you know, they should be included as well to weigh in on whether or not they can get some of their um, businesses, other contracting groups, things of that nature to want to buy in with the interns. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I hate to be, you know, say it like this, but intern is, you know, code for free labor. Um, it <laughs> you know, I, I'm just saying, you know, obviously, you know, these aren't journey level workers or even mm -hmm. really apprentices. And so no one's going to be mad if you say, hey, go clean up on the side or, hey, cold this and watch him. You know, mm -hmm. it's what we're looking for. We're looking for them to have an experience so that they can, you know, come away with a deeper understanding and and then, you know, make sure they're committed to their training and fully, you know, follow through and complete, you know, go through HCSC and complete and then go get their apprenticeship and have a happy life. Um, and I'm always kind of approaching things. When I talk to contractors, I try to think about 
what they think about, which is their bottom line, which is money. And so I usually say, hey, you know, first of all, this person already has OSHA safety training. They're not coming to you. They're not going to be a risk on your job site. Number two, um, we're just looking for like one day a week for them to shadow someone. You know, you can use them in any whatever capacity you feel is needed and because the pilot is fully funded. It's not coming off your payroll. It's a little bit of your time. You know, so that's what we're asking you to commit to me, which is a low level commitment versus you know, hey, I want you to hire 10 apprentices, which is sometimes a conversation I got to have. But, you know, that's a, that's a harder sell. So anyway, I'm just I just thought this might be the group to to add that to our to our mix. Thank you, John. And I just wanted to add in if there's anybody that you guys want to add as for instance. Um, no, I just wrote her name down and cannot find it. Um, oh, Chantel, Chantel, Jewel. Chantel, Jewel. Chantel. I'm like, where did I write that? Um, that I can invite them to the meeting. Yeah, we could do. I, I shot her a message uh, as well to text me. Um, so I think it'd be great to invite and I can, I can provide her a little, uh, insight as well. So she knows like, uh, what the heck is she getting invited to, um, and around what, what are the expectations of the conversation? So. Yeah, that's why I was kind of like, so if you kind of let me know after you talk to okay. somebody or whatever, or include me in the email and say, here, we're inviting you to this meeting. You will get the invite. So that way she'll know once I send her the invite or I'll know that once you've kind of laid the groundwork to say, hey. But also on that, I'm wondering too, if you talk to people, because it is a long meeting for the beginning for someone like that. Yeah, I agree. To join that, I mean, I'm wondering if there's a way especially for the labor side, since we have such few participants that we can let these people know, maybe you can join at. At the top of the hour. Yeah, or during the breakout session. Yeah, so somehow time it out to where, you know, let them know that we have this big introduction on what's going on. If you don't want to listen to it, maybe have them join at 11 or something. Yeah, that makes That's sense. Considerate. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard to, for us to always know when we're going to start the breakout yeah. session, but agreed. At yep. least they're not taking, I mean, it's, I think it's hard for people to take two hours out of their day if mm -hmm. they're not fully involved in the whole DOT. And so, I mean, if their thing is only about getting their workers or, you know, helping the program and getting workers out there and into internships and jobs that maybe just being in the breakout session is best. That's a I good agree. idea, Christine. And I do notice like from the last meetings, we generally, we try our best to hold the first hour um, going through the, in, the meeting and the um, data information for the projects. And then we try to, within that first hour prepare for the breakout group. So I, I do think like we could kind of say 11 if it runs over a little bit. Then um, like we'll, utilize, we'll use Chantel, for example, she may get 10 minutes of information in regards to with stop yeah. projects. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and I mean, at least I know then too, OK, there's people going to possibly be joining at the end and that's, you know, to put them in the group because I usually do watch like before the group start because people do drop off and people do <laughs> we get yeah. a lot of that yep but I mean I just can because I mean it's hard I think and not to say something bad but I think with the meeting that all that information sometimes is not as kind of repetitive for people to keep joining mm -hmm. But I think in this case with our breakout session, I think it's good to have some of those people just join later. Yeah, I agree. That's a great idea. Because I mean, the business thing, I mean, I think the business session, a lot of that information is really 
valuable to them because they're the people like going after the projects and stuff like that where labor we're just trying to put people on jobs and it looks like we probably have about three minutes left now too so i apologize you all i i need to jump off we have a, a graduation our SSST graduation tomorrow. Um, and so the staff, I've got some things I need to address with the staff. Um, Josh, I'll maybe try to shoot you something and we can come up with some dates. I want to. Yeah, shoot me a text. About, about that. Uh, for your friend and let me know if you need me to tie anything together for you, but I will see you tomorrow, John. Okay. Well, actually, you won't see me tomorrow. You'll see. Okay. Milton and Amber, I have to go over to RCI for their graduation. <laughs> and I've been asked to be the keynote speaker. So um, if, if I could be in two places at once, I definitely would be in both spots. Um, but you'll be in good hands. Um, and I appreciate you. I'll see you soon. No problem. I'm going to tell Milton, don't ask me to speak first. John <laughs> likes to work me into the back. No? <laughs> uh, yeah, tell him, tell him John saves the best for last. So you get to yes. Yes. All right, y'all. Have a great day. All Thank right, you, John. John. All right. And I'm going to be popping over to the other group just to let them know. So hopefully I don't cut you guys off in any conversation. Thank you. Thanks, mm -hmm. Christina. Oh, my goodness. I've gotten a text. I mean, I know this is outside information other than work, but I just got a text from my son that his best friend has passed away, and I do not know what... Oh no! Oh my goodness! I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, thank that. you. Oh, my goodness. These mm. kids are so young. I just don't understand. Mm. I don't think any of us do. We can't yeah. make no sense of it. I just can't. <laughs> and I mean, the last two weeks I've been doing nothing but um college visits with my son. We're working our way out of Milwaukee <laughs> and away from those types of activities. I don't you know what blame I mean? Because you. I I have, you know, no problems with my city besides the potholes, would say that, you know, <laughs> things of that, you know, there's things that you deal with and you live with, but, you know, the fear that I've had for years and um, the amount of work I've taken to make sure that my sons are not in any of those groups focused mm -hmm. on working and um, doing the things that they need to do to stay safe, it, it, it would just be easier. Mm hmm. Yeah. No, I'll pray for you and, and your son. You. I know that's rough. It's got to be rough. He's Definitely. messaging me, Mom, I'm going to walk out of school. You can <laughs> oh, no. you cannot, but how do you tell a 17-year-old that, you know? <laughs> I, right. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We should be popping back over here pretty quickly, aren't yeah. we? Yep, within the next 10 seconds. Yep, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I think we're all back. Um, thank you, Christina, for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do a, a quick um, review of our subcommittee um, activities. Uh, we'll start with the labor committee uh who from labor would like to provide a report out please i can report i can provide a quick report out here on some of the conversations that we had and, and it, i know it was an abbreviated uh session and we were able to have a real spirited conversation as we're thinking about uh you know produ providing labor and, and what that looks like so we had some great conversation uh around the recruitment efforts and the conversations with recruiting individuals who are currently incarcerated or justice impacted we came up with some ideas there on some engagement with the community reintegration center down here in milwaukee thinking about how we can continue to engage and uh have individuals that are potentially being released or potentially currently in like welding classes such and so on and so forth how to get them engaged uh, also thinking about uh, how do we turn or 
uh, uh, John Anderson brought up a great idea of looking at HCST, uh, looking at that pre-apprenticeship program and seeing how we can get that embedded into uh, the Department of Corrections so that individuals can participate prior to release. Uh, but then also talking about engagement with veterans, like what does that look like? We know that veteran population, when they when they come back, you know, when they leave from active duty, they're definitely looking for jobs right away. So how do we engage in that? So um, that took up pretty much the most of the time there that we were that we had dedicated to the conversation. But it was a very rich conversation, uh, very opportunistic conversation as we think about the employers as they continue to try to identify where their talent pipelines are going to come from, and how here in Wisconsin we can help connect those dots for those employers. Great, thank you very much. Any questions for him? Okay, moving on. I'd like to thank um, Dwayne Johnson for filling in for Bruce Van. Thank you for doing that, and he will provide our report for our, our committee. Okay, thank thank you, David. Uh, we had a very spirited discussion, and uh, we probably could have gone on for uh, for a while. Um, I want to take things a little bit out of order and go back. We talked early on in the meeting of, of a whole about safety, and uh, uh, we went to Matt Grove from the WTBA perspective, and he said, you know, we need to remember to focus on, on safety, and that was talked about earlier, so that was a part of our discussion. Um, we talked a lot about opportunity. Um, Building, uh, uh, building capacity, um, developing staff, um, adding staff, and so forth, and kind of the conundrum of, of kind of working through those different things. Uh, we talked about um, trying to look at opportunities to who wants to, which DBEs want to focus as, as primes. Uh, some don't, some want to, uh, operate as as subs some may want to operate as as primes and uh, uh, I think some of the what I heard was Tondra say that some of the white women uh, owned businesses and so forth they they focus somewhat on building as primes and stuff uh, versus some of the the ethnic minority groups and things um, There's lots of good things going on. We talked about that. Uh, perhaps if we can continue to to refine and grow how we're looking at information in terms of reporting out, that may help us uh, strive and work through some of these issues in the future. Um, we talked about really uh, opportunities to develop the the uh, minority DBE. Uh, ethnic minority, uh, minority staff, uh, whether it be on construction or from a business standpoint or or consulting, it's it's for those two groups, but also the the all of the other non DBE firms as well have the same challenge. Uh, we came back and talked a little bit about construction, uh, and that's getting off to a good start and early start, which are are good things, which I think. Uh, knock on wood bodes well for everybody at the end of the job on the balance sheet uh, standpoint. And one of the challenges is inflation is kind of eating into things. So as we build opportunities, funding levels go up, but inflation is eating into some of those those opportunities as well. But overall, good good discussion and we need to continue. Great, thank you, Duane, and thank you, um, Joshua, for those reports. Um, at this point, we got, I think, three minutes left. Are there any comments anyone would like to provide or any announcements um, for the group? Yes, thank you, Dave. Tim, Tim McMurtry, uh, NAMAC, Wisconsin, just wanted to let everyone know we are having our second annual uh, Utility Infrastructure Supplier Diversity Symposium scheduled for May 16th at Potawatomi uh, Casino Hotel. You all are welcome to come and join us and get in on the reindeer games. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Tondra. Hello. <laughs> well, I just wanted hey. to announce that um, the DBE Support Services Office has moved um, from the Milwaukee Fond du Lac um, location. And so now we're temporarily relocated 
um, at um, Waukesha Southeast Region. Um, thank you, Bob and M, for um, providing space for us. Um, we continue to look for um, space in the Rocky area. So hopefully um, that will happen before winter, <laughs> at least. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to say is um, the, the um, USDOT has, um, has final rules around the DBE program that they've just put out. Um, they become effective um, in one week from today, May 9th. Um, we are in the process of um, reviewing those final rules. Um, much of it is around certifying um, our DBEs. Um, the, the personal net worth will be increased um, for DBs to remain in the program. And there are some other, you know, things, of course, but we will be developing a white paper. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to uh, share it out on our website and perhaps with you all um, at mm -hmm. our next meeting, but just wanted to like that. Thank you. Thank you, Tundra. And speaking of next meetings, our next meeting will be July 25th um, from 10 to noon. Um, any uh, further comments or questions before we adjourn for today? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up or anybody making any comments. So with that, thank you, everyone. Tondra, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you today, everyone. Yes. Very good. Indeed. Thank you. Very good to Indeed. See you Thanks, everyone. Have a good, Thanks. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care, everyone.